Hello and welcome to What Went Down, the show where we look at the best fighters and their best nights, and also the people that were there to share those best nights. Tonight, it's a man who's won world titles at two weights. It's the Jackal. It's Carl Frampton. the variety of shot coming in from Carl Frampton. Here he comes. Here's the grandstand finish from Frampton. Another tremendous performance and another victory. Carl, thanks very much for joining me. It seems so long ago that you were fighting outdoors in the Titanic quarter against Kiko Martinez for the first of your world titles in your rematch with Kiko. It just seems so long ago, Cole. Is it as, does it seem long ago in your head or is it just me? No, it, it does. It seems like it's a long time. Yeah, I, and it was. It was 2014. That was a really special night, you know, first world title. Just the whole, the, the fact that I was in Belfast um, as a challenger, the fact that it was a purpose-built arena, the fact that from the ring, Tigers Bay, you can see it in the distance. Like it's not, it's not, it's a stone throw really from from the shipyard. So it was, it, it was just an ideal setting to, to win my first world title. And one man who was on the undercard is going to join us now and talk through not just the night, but actually talk through the fight. We're joined now by Jamie Conlon. That particular night at the Titanic quarter, Jamie, you'd been on the you'd been on the undercard for the first Kiko Martinez fight inside the Odyssey, which was a a very emotional night. But that particular night at the Titanic quarter, what are your memories of getting to the venue and walking out to the ring? There was an aura, always an aura in in Ireland. There was an aura around Kiko Martinez as this mini Mike Tyson when he came over to beat when he silenced the Point Arena beating Bernard Dunn. People forgot he lost the Rendell Monroe twice and no one cared. So when Card beat him the first time in the in the Odyssey, it was I thought it was his coming of age party. He really stepped out of his into his own. Um the build up for the fight, everything around it, with the Ulster Hall being as the as the way in, it was it was different. It wasn't your average boxing night. It was something around the buzz in the city was was exceptional. It was a nervy night anyway, but it was like unfamiliar surroundings. Everything was different. You were outdoor. It was September, but um, it was fantastic. It's time for the big one. It's the IBS Super Bantamweight Championship of the World. Would you welcome now the challenger from Belfast, Northern Ireland, Carl! The Jackal Frampton. So at this point, Carl, you've been introduced. There's 16,000 people there. You've been boxing since you was a baby. You're coming out. What's going through your mind as you're standing there looking out? What's going through your mind? Don't, I don't really know, to be honest, Steve. Um, I'm not going to try and spoof and tell you what I remember because I don't remember too much about it. But um, obviously you just... You're just focused on the fight at that stage and, and wanting to win. I remember the coldness, like Jamie had mentioned it earlier. I remember being really cold here at this point. Obviously, when you're fighting, you warm up. Um, but I, I think I think the sea breeze blowing in between rounds actually kept me fresh the whole way through the fight. Um, much easier to fight them 12 rounds than it would have been in a, in a really hot odyssey or a really hot your call, somewhere like that. Um, so it, the sea breeze was actually actually pretty nice. But I don't remember what I was thinking. Here, my mum, my ma tries to hug me here, come up to the ring. I I don't ever remember hugging my ma in my life ever before. And I remember seeing her coming to do it, to give me a hug. <laughs> I didn't want to push her away, but I did. <laughs> I didn't. Um, I remember thinking, what the, what the f*** are you doing? Like, in my, I think when I stood in the ring... I thought, if I get beat here, she's getting blamed for that hug. <laughs> Carl, was he any different in this fight? You know, was he any different? This is, this is round three. We, we, we started, we picked up in round three. Did he feel any different in the opening three rounds than the man you'd beaten in the Odyssey the year earlier? Do you, do you know, well, I don't know. I, I think that there was less of... A, he wasn't as keen 
he wasn't as aggressive as he was in the first fight, and I think that was because I knocked him out in the first fight, even though it worked a lot of rounds for the European title fight that we had. It, it worked for him in a lot of them rounds, um, but he he wasn't he wasn't as aggressive. He wasn't as keen to come forward, and I think that's simply just because it, I'd knocked him out before. And I remember actually at the weigh-in. There's a big difference at the weigh in and the and the Ulster Hall. Like I have a picture of this and the way in and for the first fight at the Europa, he was doing, you know, I'm gonna kill you gestures and he was really up for it. In the Ulster Hall, I put it on him a bit and he you know, he looked away. I, I almost think he never went a fight at a weigh in like, but I, I knew that he wasn't mentally as up for that fight as he was for the European title fight because it already beaten him. Well, well, see, uh, at the way, and I got stuck in between his crowd, and and I can I can understand Spanish and speak a, a, a little bit of Spanish. Every single one of them were trying to like g him up something shocking. He didn't speak a word, and he was just trying to get a drink into him. They were all saying like 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 you bossed that you were you were you, you were the boss there you were the, you were the gaffer kind of thing, but I don't think he truly believed it. I slipped here, he hit me in the back of the head. I remember that. It, it, that's a good free shot he takes in the back of your head there, that's for sure. Yeah, it was a good one. But um, I got led away with that one because I think I cut him the round before with my own head. So um, it was kind of evening it up a wee bit. But he, he's piling it on. Like I think he, he thought there were even that wee bit he where he knocked me down. And I, and I just slipped, but he, he thought... Something like that can change the dynamics in a fight, can't it? And, and just give someone a wee bit of momentum, even though it wasn't a shot that knocked me down. But And see, I'd see that touch of gloves as well. That's all. That's me, you know, playing games with him. Touch gloves. Let's be mates now again. You know what I mean? Calm down a bit, son. Yeah. And he touched my glove. <laughs> so. <laughs> I thought this is, I think this is where I drop him here, coming up. a good shot over the top you look for it for about 30 seconds yeah but even at this point and I remember I remember thinking I'm not going to go too mad here the round's almost over I'm not going to try and blow him away because I don't think he was he was that hurt I think he recovered pretty well because you, you catch him with the same with the same shot not not the exact same shot but the same right hand several times after after he's knocked down as well yeah, and he and he took it well, and I think something that Kiko he's got that you know marauding come forward style, but he's actually he's actually pretty hard to hit clean. Like he raids shots very well, and he moves his head well coming forward. It's hard to hit him really really clean. Like they hit him in the top of the head, and you know a lot of glancing blows, and hit him in the shoulders and stuff. So he's a he's a he's a better fighter than he gets the credit for, Kiko. And at ringside, Jamie, are you sensing him? Obviously, as Carl said, he's way, way in front. Are you starting to celebrate now? You, you know, you, you're starting to relax from the fifth round, but are you celebrating now? No, you, you're relaxed, but you're still on edge because of the previous fights that Kiko's been involved in, and he can turn it around one punch at any time. And he gave Carl some problems in the first fight with his power. So, but you did, you did, you had a sense of just a bit of calmness but he had to be aware at all times which he was the crowd at this stage jamie now i remember it i mean everybody was standing up i was standing up everybody on the broadcast team was standing up because it was that type of night it was that type of last round yeah well it was a the on the edge of your seat because you were at the very end of of what was to be a, a, a momentous night a momentous occasion the build-up was as we spoke about earlier was was exceptional, was different to all the rest. So at this moment, everyone just is praying that the bell goes and that's it. Um, when he, as he tried to finish in there, you were all so worried because Kiko was swinging back with him. So yeah, you could feel the, the, the anxiousness with, of everyone, but also the elation ready to explode. I was punctured for the rest of the round here as well. After I that. looked at I. But when you're <laughs> leaning over and you're toughing up like that, it's usually yeah. the saying that that the gas is gone. The crowd really starting to enjoy it there. You can sense that. That's that last minute, that last 30 seconds. That must have been fantastic hearing that, Carl. As focused as you were, it must have been just glorious. 
Yeah, I, I think I probably just realised that the fight was close to, to the end. Um, you're just at this stage, you're just wanting the final bell to go. You know, I, I don't think I tried to stop him there, but he, he wasn't going anywhere. So it's almost like stealing stealing a few seconds here and there, just hopefully that the, the bell goes here at any point. The crowds at that point where they cheer every single thing you do, even if yeah. you just nudge your shoulder, they cheer. I love that. Yeah, he's he's hit me with three shots, and I've hit him on the arm with one, and I get a cheer. It's <laughs> it's good for the home fighter. Like. You know you've won the title there, Carl. I mean, two of the judges yeah. will give it to you by you know eleven points, one by one by seven. You know you've won the title there. Can you allow yourself to celebrate at that point? Or, or, or is there something in you saying, just wait for them to raise my hand? Just wait no, for that moment. I don't know. I knew. I kind of, I knew. I had, like, I wanted, I felt like I want to convince Lee. There was a knockdown in there as well. I'm at home. Nobody's cheering for him. Um, yeah. Do you know what? Look at that. And that annoys me. See Craig Stevens, and I'm going to have a bone to pick with him. So my dad brought my daughter into the ring. And yep. How, how nice would it have? She was asleep, but how nice would it have been to get a photograph with my daughter in the ring? Craig Stevens told him to get out. No. What's it got? What's it got to do with the, Craig the, Stevens? The MC. The MC. Got, what's it got to do no. with him? I missed an amazing opportunity for one of the best photographs of all time, and Craig Stevens, his fault. Well, it's got nothing to do with him, and and that you, you pointed it out to me <laughs> the first time. But but forget that moment. And, and you're right, that was a lost opportunity. Your hands raised, the crowd can relax. Here, you are look. the world champion. There he is. That was him telling them to get out. Sorry. <laughs> nah, it was just it was great. A world champion, unreal. My my whole family were a mum and dad. My dad never gets into the ring or does anything like that, and. And he was in the ring, and my wife's in the ring. She never gets in the ring. There's um, everyone's in the ring, you know. It's just it was unreal. It was unreal. Jamie, thank you so much for your time. We're going to speak now to, to Michael Conlon. Uh, Mike, thanks for finding time to join us. Um, it's the What Went Down Carl Frampton show. Um, a major part, I would have thought, of your growing up, the last six or seven or eight years of big fights in Belfast, what's it been like being at those fights? What's it been like watching those fights? It's been unbelievable, and it is all down to this man here, Carl. You know, it's been his shows, it's been his atmospheres, it's been, it's been special. Um, someone who I've looked up to for many years, someone who I've wanted to follow in his footsteps, and every time you go to the show, you're just like, Jeez, I can't wait for it to be me. I can't wait for it to be me. And it's he, he brought big time boxing back to Belfast and, and held it there for a long, long time. And, you know, you had that phenomenal outdoor show uh, a couple of summers ago. It seems like forever ago, doesn't it, that we were in the falls yeah. and that was that, that brilliant night outdoors. So that was all part of that same tradition. Uh, but your brother was talking earlier about how before Carl... You know, it was leisure centres and maybe this fight or maybe a big mm. fight was promised. But suddenly with Carl, it, it, and, and I know you're there, Carl, I don't want to embarrass you. It was like we were guaranteed, we, the Royal We, we were guaranteed fights. We were guaranteed yeah. big nights. I think, like, for me, being Jamie's brother and him being on cards, undercards, I don't think he'd be boxing today if it wasn't for Carl coming through because he wouldn't have had the opportunities which he, he had. And... It was due to Carl having the shows in Belfast and bringing the exposure to every fighter who was on that undercard. The reason why most of them are probably still boxing today or are still involved in boxing is because of him. So, um, yeah, it is a bit awkward speaking about something and trying to like it makes people feel a bit like, oh, why is he talking about me like that? But you are like what you've done for the city and what you've done for every fighter in the city has been unbelievable over the last oh. ten years. Very, thank you very much, mate. It's nice to hear. And just see before you go on there, Steve. I talking about atmospheres and stuff. I was when when Mick fought on the Falls Park. I was in Philly getting ready for that fight that never happened when I broke my hand. And we all we all got around to to watch it in a wee Irish pub in Philly. And my missus was there, and she'll tell you it's the best boxing atmosphere she's ever been to. She described it. She did. 
she described it as a as a rave with a wee bit of boxing in the background. <laughs> <laughs> Michael, it's been a delight and a pleasure and humbling talking to you uh, tonight. We'll see you soon and hopefully at some point this year we'll have an enormous night out with you crowned as the new champion. Definitely, Michael, definitely. thanks so much for your time. It's the summer of 2016, New York City, and Carl's there to fight the unbeaten Leo Santa Cruz for the world featherweight title. And also on the undercard is a young man having his sixth contest. That man is Josh Taylor. And I'm delighted to say that Josh joins us now. Josh, what was it like on the night inside the Barclays Center? Because cause, cause we, we sometimes forget that at that point, Leo Santa Cruz was the one who was being tipped to move up to Super Feather, to move up to Lightweight, to get himself in some massive fights. We overlook that sometimes. He was unbeaten. He was the star. What was that like that night? Oh, it, was, it was just brilliant. Obviously, I had boxed a wee bit earlier on in the night, you know, so I was on a high of winning as well. You know, I, I like to go into the change rooms to see Carl, but not for too long. I like to stay out his way. I'll go in and say good luck and all the best and watch him warming up just a little bit. Um, I see him get in the zone and I, and I get out of the way, but I remember being very nervous for him. Um, more nervous for Carl than I was for myself, you know, because I wanted them to see him do it. I saw the, the hard work that I'd put in and the preparation that I'd put in, so... I was very, very nervous for him, and you know, and, and I, I was more nervous for him than I was myself. But the, the atmosphere in the place was just electric, you know. Um, I was just totally zoned into the whole fight, so I never had any, I never got any um, pictures or videos of of the night. I was just uh, totally in the zone and, and soaking up the moment. And uh, you know, I remember watching the fight with such intent, and I scored it. I think Carl by, by about three rounds. Um, by three rounds, I, I had him winning it, and you know. My, my score uh, prediction was right and I remember just the crowd going nuts and you know and, and like seeing everybody after it and you know it's just a a great great experience you know one that I'll, I'll never forget it's definitely the best um, boxing experience um, I've had um, to date and uh, it was brilliant you know I'll never forget that he's the champion he's younger than you he's unbeaten in 33 fights Carl it was a big risk, and, and, and no disrespects, I can see why most of the Americans, especially, thought that you were there to lose. Yeah, look, and I don't know if it was a big risk, because I'd, I'd, I'd unified at, the, at that division. I'd, I'd beaten Hugo Cazares in a final eliminator for Leo's WBC Super Bantamweight title. Um, at, well, Super Bantamweight, and, and he didn't want to fight me. And at all these fights, so the, the Santa Cruz fight, the Quig fight, they all came off the back of me being dropped in El Paso when, when Josh made his debut. Um, so I, don't, I, don't, I didn't see it as a risk. Really didn't see it as a risk. I, I, I was going over there. He had boxed lower than me. He was like originally a, a bantamweight starting at his career. Although he's a taller sure. guy, I felt like I was, a str I was a stronger fighter. And what did it feel like on the night, strength-wise? He didn't feel strong. It just his, his output was a lot it was great and, and I knew I needed to kind of match his output and and not let him overwhelm me but he wasn't he wasn't physically very very strong could you feel it could you feel the fight taking a toll on you or, or taking a toll on your strength and on your stamina were you wary of that knowing full well of his his, his punch output and knowing that this guy can do 12 he likes 12 he can go that long uh, yeah, look, I was really, really tired in the fight, and, and after the second half, it was just kind of you're on autopilot, and you're just. It was all, but it was important to not let him overwhelm me or, or out punch me. And I know he, he threw more punches on me, but I, I still punched with him. It's probably the most punches I ever threw myself in a fight, um, and it was important to, it was important to be able to, to try to try my best to to match his output. And Carl, this is this is the the ninth round, the ninth round here. You know, I, I I remember having you, in my opinion, a good a good three or four rounds up. But wondering sometimes maybe how the judges got it, and also wondering if we were going to see a mad surge from Santa Cruz. We say that as he puts you under a bit of pressure on the ropes. Yeah, um, 
Yeah, I was, I was waiting, but he was he was still there was a lot of pressure. He was applying a lot of pressure the whole fight, so I don't know how much he could have applied. And and again, I was just kind of meeting him head on and 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 trying to work with him and and you know seemingly landing landing the better shots. I think this may have been around. I can't remember exactly, but he had a he had his best round. I think number eight, and I think it was important for me then. I think I won this round. I can't remember, but. It was important for me to have a strong round just, just straight after, yeah. You stand up there, Carl, to come out for the 12th and final round, seconds before the bell, and, and you can see it there. You Maybe you saw it at the time, but everybody is standing, perhaps other than just one or two officials at ringside. What must that, what, what must, I mean, I'm asking you as a fan, what must, and I've been at enough big fights, what must that be like, Carl? What is that like when it's your last round? In a world title fight you're winning, just what's, what's that like? I don't know, Steve. Uh, you know, uh, I don't want to. I don't want to make something up here, but I, I, don't, I don't really know. It's just like win, win the round. Don't get knocked out. I, th I suppose like I felt like I was in front. I knew it was close, but I felt like I was doing enough to win the fight. So I think I was probably just thinking, don't get, don't get chinned here. So you're focused. You're not milking it. You're not doing a rocky. You're not playing to the cheap seats. You just want to get through this fight. Doesn't matter where it is. It doesn't matter. Just get through this three minutes and don't get chin. Yeah, look, just get it, get it done, get it finished. Wait on the final bell, and um, I suppose at this stage we're with a minute and a half in this round to go. And yeah, that's probably the only thing that's on my mind. Just try and stay with him again. Don't let him overwhelm me. That was a good shot of landed there, and. Um, you know, just just stay in there, really. And I, and I knew I knew at the end, like I'd done enough. I felt like I'd done enough. But it was you're always being away from home. You don't know what the judges are going to see. But I felt like I had I had done enough. Could you sense any desperation in in, in um, as we're going into this? Could you sense any in, any desperation in Santa Cruz's work? Can you sense that he senses that he's losing this fight or lost this fight, and that this is his big chance, the last three minutes? Did you get that sense? No, I don't think he was desperate because I think you know the pressure that he's applying in the twelfth round was the same the whole way through the fight, so it didn't feel it didn't really feel any different to me. Um, and he wasn't a, he wasn't complaining to the referee. He's not one of them types of fighters. He just he just tries to fight, and I knew. Like I expected that before the fight, that that was going to be the case. It's a great round, this. I'd forgotten how good this round is, to be honest with you, Carl. This is a great last round, a great three minutes. There was a, there was a round, and it's, it's probably this one was, it didn't win it, but it was voted round of the year for that year, um, Ring Magazine and stuff. But it was a, it was a very good round. Look, I'm just, I'm just square on. Like everything goes out the window here. Like it's real novelty <laughs> the pace stuff. The fight was unbelievable. But the pace of the fight was unbelievable, wasn't it? I was just watching it there. That last round was just mental. Yeah, it was a uh, what a fight to watch. Brilliant. You, you know, it's a special fight when everything goes out the window in the last 20 seconds. And as you say, you're both standing square on. And you just traded. There was a moment there when Leo Santa Cruz's father walks past you, and he know he knows his son's blown it. He knows in the corner, and he knows when he walks away. I I think he did. Yeah, the dad never. I don't know if the dad really ever liked me to be honest. Um, but the brothers did. The brothers did. Um, but I think I think they knew that he lost. I I think Santa Cruz knows he's lost. Yeah. And Tom Schreck seeing it 117 to 111 in favor of the winner by majority decision. And the new WBA featherweight champion of the world, the great Irish champion, Carl the Jackal Frampton. The great Irish champion, Carl. That's not a bad label. No, it was good. That and I think see see the scorecards being read out, one seventeen, one eleven. I thought that was probably a bit wide, but I knew that it couldn't have been for him. Like there's no way he's won it by that amount. So once I heard that, I kind of knew in my head that that I that I've won it here. And Barry was running the boat. Barry was saying stuff like, um, I think I remember him saying. 
Showtime have him four rounds up or something like that. And Shane says, Showtime, like, let's see what the judges say here. You know what I mean? So um, I think he was a bit worried that Barry was going to have it in my head that I've won and maybe I haven't won because of, you know, who knows what way the scoring's going to be. But, yeah. Now, you're right. What, what, once I heard that score, which was quite wide, you get the sense then, you know, there's, 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 it's okay now. It's okay because they're not yeah. going to give it to Santa Cruz by six or seven rounds under any circumstances. <laughs> uh, Josh, j just finally, you fought on the undercard. You'd fought on Carl's debut. That was your sixth fight on the undercard there. You'd fight on the rematch the, fo the following year. You were uh, still a relative novice. It was like you're living in fantasy land, Josh. You're living in fantasy land. I know, yeah, it was, uh, I couldn't have had a, a better start to my career, you know, my, my debut was in El Paso and that was on a big world title fight, you know, and then, then in New York and then and then in Vegas again for the rematch, so yeah, I had, I had an absolutely cracking start to my to my career and, you know, it's, uh, it's all due to Carl being involved in the big fight, so I was just thankful to be part of it and be there and, and watch and learn and how we, how we done things, so I, I had a, I had a sort of great apprenticeship, so to speak, to uh, watching and learning from Carl. It was a, uh, you couldn't have bought that experience. So yeah, it was, it was brilliant. It was brilliant. Hi, good Steve. Just before Josh, just just before Josh goes, how good is it going to be for me to be able to say that the undisputed late welterweight champion in the world was on my undercard and he made his debut on my undercard and everything else? Like that's a proud <laughs> moment for me. You know what I mean? So um, there's no doubt he's going to go on and, and beat Ramirez and what. Yeah, thanks, Carl. Appreciate it. Thank you. Josh Taylor, thanks so much for your time this evening. Thank you, Josh. No worries. Thanks for having me. Thanks. thanks, Josh. Now, it wasn't just the Irish Americans who were attracted to the fight. We saw Roy McElroy at ringside, but another man was ringside. A man that brings his camera and a man that brings, well, just about everything, really. Colin Murray. So, Colin, what persuaded you to get on a plane and go and watch Carl Frampton win a world title with about six or seven or 8,000 um, New Yorkers from the East Coast on a glorious night in New York City? I just can't imagine what possibly inspired you to do it. <laughs> it was brilliant, mate. My brother lives out in the States, so it's perfect. So, we, he, he travels all the way back for Northern Ireland games and then... So it was brilliant to, to go over that side and go to New York. From a fan's point of view, we turned up and uh, got our tickets. And then we're given these wristbands for a backstage bar. And I was, my brother goes, let's go there. And I'm like, no, it's, they're always rubbish. It'll just be that pretentious nonsense. Let's go to our seats, watch the undercard, enjoy the night. Oh, go on, let's go in. I never get to go. They say, all right, we'll go in for five minutes. So we opened the door and it was like opening the door to a bar back home in Belfast that Michael O'Neill was sitting re as red faced as you can imagine buckets of beer with <laughs> Harry Barnes um, Christine Blakely shouted profanities at me as soon as I walked in the door and everyone was just absolutely rode off absolutely rode off <laughs> 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 it, was, it was right a good crack like but I, I just that the build up that's what I remember mostly was just walking in the you know just Northern Irish voices from the door to the Brooklyn Bowl to the VIP bar to walking through your seats and just saying that guy that you know from the Czech Republic away, that guy you know from growing up, that that, that girl you, you, you knew from, uh, you know, Lavery's or whatever. That's what it was like. I've never really <laughs> been away and seen it so Northern Irish. It was ridiculous. So Irish, I should say, actually. Uh, so, so, Colin, you, you know your sport also. So you knew that how good Santa Cruz was. So even though you're there and you've had a great time backstage in the bar and you reunited with your brother, I understand all that, but you also knew how difficult and how hard a night it was going to be. At what point in the fight, or did you never, could you slightly relax and enjoy the fight? Or was it constantly, you know, because you don't want to ruin your high by a defeat, do you? Let's get it right. I, I think when a fight is in America, you never truly relax unless the the American fighter or the Mexican fighter is knocked out cold. I think like there was one judge who was obviously suffering from cataracts or something, uh, who who scored it even. But um, and the other two got it, I think, about bang on, didn't they? Um, so it, yeah. it, it wasn't so far apart that your arse wasn't going five p fifty p right up until it was announced. You know. <laughs>
<laughs> Cole, when, when, in that last round, the last 30 or 40 seconds, I know you're standing up. I know you and your brother are standing up, living every single punch. At, at, the, at the final bell, did, did you fall into his arms? Were you punching the air? You, I know you're saying about the judges, but what was that like? What was that like, that, that end? There's always that. If you weren't so emotionally connected to your homeboy winning, you, you probably would be a lot more relaxed. But nobody really was, apart from Michael O'Neill, who probably needed told the next day he was there. <laughs> and Colin, once the decision was announced, once everybody's in full voice, you, you, you remembered one thing, no matter how much you had to drink, you got your phone out and you captured yeah. that moment. It, it's like you're in a rocking boat. Look at this. I have no idea I took this. <laughs> That's what is that? Was that from my Twitter account? Yeah, I, think I so, have yeah. no idea. No, I have no that very well. I'm sure that looks like where it's at. Um, I have no idea. <laughs> Uh, you should always put your phone away when you're drunk. Yes, that's lovely. And you, you've got to remember as well that me the, the Mexican fans that were in there was maybe about 3,000. They started singing, ole, 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 ole. Which, of course, then all the Irish were like, hey! <laughs> 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 always, always remember that backfiring uh, massively. <laughs> um, but, yeah, that's amazing. I haven't seen that since that night. That must, I must have tweeted that out, blitzed. So... I have to, I have to thank Colin here. Let me, let me thank him before we go, Steve, because it took me a long time to get back to the hotel. When we got back to the hotel, there was the bar was closed, and I was racked anyway. So I was a bit of a, it was a bit of a boring one for me after the fight. But Colin had bought a few beers back, and the only reason I had a bottle of beer after the greatest win of my life was because of Colin Murray. So I have to thank See? him for both me. We made up for it the next day, and I had a, we had an unbelievable party the next day. Proper blitzer, and it's funny that I always remember going back to the hotel because I went back not like as in right cars, cars there, cars families there. My mates were staying there, so uh, Ruth and all them. So we went back there, and there was a very big divide, Bunsy, between the ones who'd been at the fight and didn't have to get punched or watch their family members getting punched, and you know, the actual family, which was relief and like just sh shattered. I remember just two things he did to me after the fight. One, he hugged me leaving the ring, which I didn't want, right? We all kind of, I think Nesbitt was right there as well. But anyway, he, he, I remember you hugging down the line and I'm like, well, I can't say no, but I don't really want covered in all the sweat. It wasn't really good. <laughs> but I remember being like disgusted by it. That's like, the truth. Uh, and then when we got back, was like there was the ones that were all up for the party, and then I think it was just a lot of relief and happiness in the family. And like your, I remember you had a beer, slice of pizza, and then your kid, and you went you went straight to bed. So you're, you're right, you were bored, but I always remember sitting there, and your family were there, and then we were all a bit more party like. And then your wife was there, and she hates me, so that was awkward. And then you came back. <laughs> <laughs> and stars. Anyway, so then you came back and just went straight. And I always think that's that's it. I, I love the fact I got to see the first bit of you off camera after the interviews when you left the ring and you just the happiness, the elation um was like really I felt like it was a, an invasion of privacy almost if you were that close to it to see what that meant it was unbelievable as soon as the camera wasn't following you, you know. And then getting back and just seeing the relief and just going to bed. Like, they were two really special moments, I think. Colin, thanks so much for those memories. They're proper memories. And I know exactly what you mean about glimpsing a fighter when the cameras are off. That does feel like a privilege. Colin, thanks so much for your time. Before we return to Belfast for the Nanito Denair fight, let's bring in Jamie Moore, the man that trained him for that fight and had taken over in the previous fight. Jamie, welcome to What Went Down. Um, now, it wasn't the first fight you and Carl worked together, Donaire, but it was still a massive fight. It was a fight for two things. It was a fight to shine, but it was also a fight to potentially slip up. Even though it wasn't Donaire's strongest weight, he's still an idol. He's still a champion. Yeah, of course he was. He was a uh... He, he still is a massive puncher, um, even even at that weight. Um, it was always a, a risky fight to take, but obviously because of his name and, and what that carries with it, it was worth. It was a risk worth taking. And uh, you know, Carl, Carl had a tough fight. The fight, our first fight together, 
Um, so we probably would have been forgiven of going into into an easier fight, but I, we, we both felt like it was a fight that Carl would win and, and, and he needed that sort of test to bring out the best of him. Come in the build-up to the fight, it was it was no surprise that you and Donair seemed pally, seemed friendly. I know you went out after the fight. Was was that him perhaps trying to just be a nice guy with you, or or is he a nice guy? Yeah, uh, do you know what? I think I think he is a nice guy. Well, I know he is a nice guy because I've got the norm since. But I thought at the time he can't be that nice. There's there's absolutely no way he's this nice. But he, he is. It turns out he's he's a really good guy, and and I have a great relationship with Nanito. My wife Christine has a great relationship with his wife Rachel. Um, and he, he look at he was doing all stuff with the kids and all here. I remember I remember thinking to myself, he's really getting everybody on his side here. Like I, there's a potential I'm going to walk out to the ring and people are going to be booing me to the ring because I'm fighting <laughs> dinner. But um, now nah, he's uh, he's genuinely. One of the nicest people I've ever met. He's a he's a great guy. From the Philippines, the Filipino Flash, Nonito Donier. The atmosphere at night was amazing. Like the the atmosphere in the Odyssey. The Odyssey's capacity is nine thousand, but it's it's so in terms of arena sizes, it's not a massive arena, but it's an amazing atmosphere. It really is. I'd love I'd love it to be. Imagine, imagine having an arena like the MEN in Belfast. Like uh, the atmosphere would be, it'd be off the hook. Like you, you can't, you can't compete with a Belfast atmosphere. I don't think. Steve, there's a funny story to this. So this shouldn't have been Carl's ring walk music, and he, he he was having a song for for his wife Christine to come out to. It was like a little tribute for her, and um, and as soon as the music start sort of started, I was like, this is the wrong song. And I went over to the, the sound guy and was like, this is the wrong song. And he said, this is the only one we've got. So Carl had sort of turned his back to everyone because I could see he was, he was raging. And uh, I just saw, I went over and I said, listen, this is it. You've just got to do, make ring walk. And he screamed a swear word. And, um, and just sort of cool as you like, just turned around, took a big deep breath and cracked on with, it, with a job at hand. So um, the ultimate professional on, on that night. Uh, so I want I wanted a song and uh, big big Ian. It was his fault. He took the blame for it. But I remember Ralph, who uh, who does the ring walk for everybody. He was the song came on, and I said it's a wrong song. So Jimmy was liaison with Ralph. I stood for about a minute, I think, hoping that they were going to change the song. Um, and then I got to the point where Jimmy says, "This is it. They can't change the song." And I. I I said what I said and walked on, but I remember being raging. The, the fight started, here we are in, in, in round two. Sometimes people look back on this fight and just dismiss it as being it wasn't Donaire's weight. Well, I was three feet from the ringside that night and, and it often felt like Donaire was extremely comfortable at featherweight. Don't worry about that. He was a classy fighter, Jamie. It certainly is, Bunsy, and um, you can see here, so the big the big danger is that left hook. It, uh, it always has been. He's such a powerful left hook, and his timing of it really, really does add to it. Um, so so our main job was to avoid that and not, not putting putting Carl in a position where he was going to be left open. So we, we knew Carl would have good success with a right hand, but that led into the danger of being left open for a counter left hook. So we had to make sure that Carl was in, Carl's head was in a position where it, it wasn't going to be there for, for, for the check left up. So we had to make sure his feet travelled with it and, uh, because Carl doesn't naturally roll out after a, after a right hand. Um, and his feet are so good, he, he covers quite a bit of distance. So the plan was to, to nail him with the right hand, but, uh, to, but to make sure that his head went with it so that he ended up sort of in a position past Nanito's right shoulder so that he was well away from the left hook and it, it seemed to work quite well. Did you sense this, Carl, as one of, one of the most technical and tactical fights you've had? Big fights, big fights. Yeah, it was, and I knew I had to be careful the whole way through it. it he, he hit me on the arm in the first round in a, in a bit of a clinch, and I remember just thinking, 
full wag. Like I really need to be careful here. Um, like if he hits you clean, it could be lights out. And um, I, I wasn't hurt um, in this fight at all up until the eleventh round, where he hurt me. He hurt me pretty badly in the eleventh round. But I, I, I knew, like I knew. You've seen the highlight reels of Dinar. It's one of the best knockout highlight reels you'll ever see. He makes people do like, twi you know, he leaves them twitching on the ground and stuff. So I had to, be, I had to be extremely careful. I was always cautious that left hook. That was drilled into me from the start, from day one in training camp, like the left hook. And but it's, it's almost like you forget about the rest of the things he can do. Good. It's not, you know, a left. It's not all he has, a left hook, but I, I knew that was the one that I had to be extremely cautious about. You see, that's what, what I was talking about before, Bunsy, about his, 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 his ring craft and his ring generalship. He doesn't look like he's doing a lot a lot of the time, but the end product is always him trying to manoeuvre you into those positions and make mistakes so that he can get you with that shot. And that's what we was really conscious of, was not allowing Carl to to fall into those traps of being sort of led into a false sense of security to, to make those mistakes. This is the 12th and final round, Carl. Um, yeah. Once again, you're coming out for the 12th round. Big crowd, big backing, lots of expectation. Yeah, this was, I remember, so I'd been hurt the round before in the 11th round, and, and it felt like, in, in my head, in the fight, I, I felt like I'd been hurt pretty badly, but watching it back, it doesn't look as bad as I felt. So I remember sure. going sure. coming out for the twelfth round, and Jamie had knew I was hurt, obviously, um, and it was just like, don't go and try and finish strong. Don't go and try and like you've won the fight. Don't be doing anything daft. Just keep boxing, um, and and that was it. That's I was really really cautious in this round. Overly cautious just because of how dangerous he still was. I think what happened in, at the end of the eleventh round was a blessing in disguise because I think if if he'd, he'd not caught that good shot at the end of it and, and felt that power, you could have easily fell into that trap of going out and trying to finish strong, which could have led to the undoing then in, in the last round. So it's probably you got a blessing. Early. Yeah, if you get caught early in rounds, it's much, much more difficult to get through. We was lucky that it was at the end of the 11th round, really. What goes you know, at the end of the fight, Carl? You know, a twelve rounder like that, and you know, you know, you're one. What, what's going through your mind there? Is it just relief, or is it, or, 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 or is there a bit of excitement? What is, what, what's the gen, what's the general feeling going through your mind now? It's all, it's over. Yeah, you're all, you're relieved that it, it's just done. And and this was the fight before Windsor, and I knew Windsor was next. So I was, I was over the moon. I was over the moon that that was the next thing for me, um, Windsor Park. So. Fully focused on that from here, from this point forward. Jamie Moore, thanks so much for your time this evening. Cheers, Steve. Always good to hear from Jamie Moore. Now, you might have caught glimpses of him throughout the show. The smooth voice of boxing at ringside commentating, John Rawling. Now, Nonito Denea, John, is such a stylish, such a glorious boxer to watch. Is there ever a risk? And I'm, I'm, I'm being deadly serious. Is there ever a risk? Because as you're, as you're watching him, you metaphorically put your feet back and just put your hands behind your head and start to enjoy him and forget that you're actually working. Is there a chance with that? Well, he is a little bit one of those who does your job for him, for you, doesn't he? Because he, I mean, technically, he is so good. He's, he's polished. He doesn't, he doesn't appear to have a a conspicuous weakness in his armory. You know, he's got all the skills. He can bang a bit. He can move. He's got great balance. And he's also a thoroughly nice bloke. He was a, he was a pleasure to deal with in, in Belfast in the week, in the, in the run-up to the fight. He charmed the Belfast public. I'm sure Carl would agree. And, uh, you know, when it came to the night, there was a real buzz about the place because uh, Belfast, you know, a city which loves its boxing, had got right into that Denaire fight. Carl, let me ask you a question. You're in the ring behind closed doors at York Hall. Could you hear John and Richie off commentating? Will you be listening for them when, when, when they come out to Herring? I mean, you know, what, what, if, what, if Rawling, what if Rawling makes you three rounds down after four? What are you going to do if you can hear him clearly? Do you know what? I was a bit worried about that um, in that fight against Darren Trainer, listening to commentary. But 
I think John Pegg may have had a go at Sky about the commentators being so close to the ring, and he they did. moved them back, so they were far enough back. And put them in a box. For, and I put them in a box. They were far enough back uh, that I couldn't hear them. But I heard them once before. I fought in the York Hall, actually, against Chris Hughes, and I heard, I remember being able to hear um, Jim Watt, and it was, anno- it was annoying me. He was being complimentary to me, but it was annoying me being able to hear his commentary as well. So I was always, I was worried that that was going to be the case, but I couldn't hear them. And hopefully it's going to be the same this time that the commentators are far enough away. Because imagine them saying something that's annoying you, like being derogatory or having a go at you. It would do your nuts. <laughs> Well, Martin Bowers, Martin Bowers said to me that he'd, uh, we'd had a couple of shows at, uh, at the BT studios and he had been able to hear, hear me and, uh, and Richie. And I'd said something to him. And he said he felt for all the world like turning around and <laughs> having a go. You know, sort of, no, it's not that way. He's OK. He's winning. We know what we're doing. Shut up. Give us a break. Uh, in slightly more florid language. <laughs> John, listen, it's been an absolute pleasure getting you on tonight to talk about A, your Denaire memories, but also some of the trials and tribulations of commentating from ringside. John Rawling, thanks for your time. We're joined now by promoter Frank Warren. Frank, thanks for finding time to, to, to join with us, sit with us. Now, Frank, I'm going to ask you a simple question straight away. How did it come about, your deal with Carl? How did it come about promoting Carl? Um, what happened was uh, I read in the newspapers that he split with uh, um, Barry McGuigan, uh, which, as, as everybody knows, it's common knowledge, became a court case and eventually was settled to Carl's satisfaction. Um, then, ha- having heard that they were split up, I then uh, contacted him. I rang him direct. I invited him to come over um, and he flew over and him and I went into uh, BT. We met with the Steve Norris, who was there at the time. And we talked about what we'd like to do and fresh out a deal. And that's, that's what happened. And what's one of the things you wanted to do, what Carl wanted and wanted since he was a child, a fight at Windsor Park, outdoors, in the sunshine, glorious August day. Was that one of your plans, Frank? Or was that one of Carl's no, that was plans? One of his, that was one of his plans. He insisted that was part of the deal. And it's actually written into the contract, <laughs> I remember, Carl. So I had to deliver, yeah. which I told him I would deliver promised him I would deliver on that. And, that uh, that's the thing, frankly, just to put in there, Frank, Frank made me a promise that he could deliver Windsor Park and that was one of the things that got it over the line and um, he did it, he did it for me, so I was delighted. There was some night that at Windsor Park, I know the weather, well, I say the weather let us down, it didn't seem to bother anybody except for the, the, the broadcast crew that kept getting wet. Everyone else seemed to love every single second of it, Carl. Yeah, it, do, do you know what, it probably added to the whole evening and event, it just made it a bit, it's a bit like a festival, like people, the rain doesn't affect people when they go to Glastonbury, does it? They all seem to enjoy themselves and it was a bit, a bit similar this time, people just, just added to the whole thing and everyone talks about the rain that night still, um, but they always remember it to be a great night. Well, they were all doing the Gene Kelly, weren't they, at ringside, they're all singing. Yeah. <laughs> singing and dancing in an awful lot of rain. But Carl, all, all jokes aside, what was that like walking out? I mean, it's not just walking out in Belfast, which is special to a Belfast fire. I understand that. It's not just walking out in front of a big crowd. It's walking out in front of a place where you'd stood on the terraces as a boy. You know, you'd been there. It's part, it was part of your boyhood, part of your childhood. It was, it was magic. I remember walking out and just before I kind of got onto the ramp, Jamie Moore says to me, soak this in now just soak this in take it all in remember and remember this and and i did that and it was a it was a slow ring walk and i wanted to make the most of it and i'm smiling on my way to the ring I, you know you're normally you're normally not smiling i'm not normally anyway i'm kind of usually straight faced and, and ready to fight but I, I was just i couldn't stop smiling i was just delighted that that i was i was doing what i was doing and um obviously the fight worked out well in the end as well so that was a, it was a great night and one that, you know, I, I've, had, I've had many big nights, but that's, that's very close. If not the top, it's close to the top of the list. Very important for Carl. You know, he wanted that moment. We wanted to deliver it to him. But I knew fighting in front of his, his home crowd, in front, of his, in front, obviously, at the venue he wanted to be in, in front of his own fans, it brought it out of him. I knew it would, and he, he was fabulous that night. A lot of respect between these two lads all the way through the build-up. 
that that kind of ends now, because this is it. A great domestic showdown, the IBF featherweight world title. Is Warrington going to retain, or will Carl Frampton move back towards his dream? But that night in Manchester, Carl, when you lost to to Josh War, to, to, to Warrington, that was, I, 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 know, I know it's a loss, but it's a special night. Yeah, Doug, it's happened now, so I, I'm not dwelling on that fate. You know, I lost the fate, and I'm disappointed with, with my own performance and getting dragged in the, an absolute war, but I, I'm kind of proud that I, I finished it on my feet after them first three rounds, so it just, I just got it completely wrong on the night, um, but I stayed in there, and I, I've always, always wanted to be in one of them types of fights, but obviously, to get my hand raised at the end, um, that was that was the only thing that was, went wrong with that, but look, people remember that, they talk about the atmosphere, they talk about the fight, I've, I've mentioned this before, and the, the big mistake that I made was I underestimated Josh's punching power. Like I knew the fight was going to be difficult and, and hard and he was very fit and strong. Um, I thought it was going to be a long fight, um, but I thought I didn't, I didn't feel like he had the power to hurt me and that was a massive mistake that I made. I've never been hurt as much in a fight in my life and he hurt me in the first minute. He hurt me in the second round again, but he hurt me a, a few times throughout the fight. Now we're joined by Paddy Barnes. And first of all, a few rules. You two can't snipe at each other. You can get together later on this afternoon and snipe at each other from 10 feet away. But please, whilst we're on air, let's just be civil if we can. Paddy, welcome. Welcome to Carl Fram the Carl Frampton Show. Let's put it that way. <laughs> Paddy, you've known... You've, uh, well, hey, that's what it is, Paddy, whether you like it or not. Now, you've known, you've known Carl a long time. How many times do you think you and him have boxed on the same night, amateur and pro? Um, about 15 times amateur, easy. Um, as a pro... We actually, we actually, just before you go on, we actually boxed each other four times four as amateurs. I, 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 three, one me. I won three <laughs> out of the four. But everyone knows it's between each. Uh -huh. But as a pro, we've boxed in the same show, I think, three times. Card was on my undercard in Windsor Park. So <laughs> <laughs> I fought for a word title, he fought for nothing. That, 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 night at Win that night at Windsor Park, or that afternoon, evening at Windsor Park, it was, yeah. um, it was a big night there. It was a big night. I know, I know it wasn't a great night for you, but it was a big night. Yeah, it was a massive night, you know. I think the fit at Windsor Park for, for Carr anyway, you know, it was a, it was a boy who dream of his, the fit at Windsor Park, and that, that became a, a reality, sold out, and for himself, you know, and you know, obviously it's a body for me, but, you know, because Carr's a very good friend of mine, I was happy to see him filling out the arena and getting a win and taking a box for one of his, his dreams. Now, the two of you, um, obviously you fought each other, you've known each other, you're both from Belfast. You're, you're a bit of an unlikely couple in some ways because you do, you, you do bitch and moan at each other quite regularly, which I, quite, which I find entertaining. But, but you've both been involved with, with, with each other's marriages in the nicest possible way. Yeah, Paddy was... Um, well, this is, a, this is a wee... something that irks me a wee bit. Paddy was best man at my wedding, but I was only... I was demoted to groom's man. I wasn't, I wasn't best man at his. Groom's man only. Well, the, 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 can, I finish, can, I, can I put it inside? The reason for that card... You see, I asked a priest about this, and he says, listen, Paddy, you can't have a present as your best man, so... <laughs> <laughs> Blame the church. Yeah. So, so, Paddy, was Carl a very special groomsman? Not just a groomsman. He wasn't lumped together with 50 other groomsmen. He was a very special groomsman, at least. Give him that, give him that credit. Yeah, of course. 100% he was. He was the only groomsman who has a professional world title, so he's special. P Paddy, I'm gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna get a message. This is for the pair of you. We're gonna get a message from uh, Luke Jackson, who, of course, you bashed up that night, um, Carl. We've managed to have our very own Charlesy track him down, and he sent you a special message. This is Luke Jackson, 
talking to you, Carl, on what went down. It was a crazy experience, but absolutely crazy. The best moment of my career, without a doubt. And the people were very friendly, you know. Um, all week, they were very good. And after the fight, uh, when I went and had a few beers the next day, they were, um, you know, very supportive. Uh, we ended up having a few beers with Ricky Hatton. Uh, it was a big night, trust me. I remember walking out, and obviously I was pretty nervous. Um, and Tyson Fury was walking in as I was walking out. He just had his fight, and he and he gave me a fist pump. Very, very loud. It's like 24,000 people there, I think it was. It was unbelievable. I, I think I had maybe 11 people there for me. But as I said, I don't think it would have mattered where I fought Kyle Frampton. He was just a better fighter than me. So I can read a jab very well. I slipped that jab in front of right hand. That's one of my money punches. And he's got a distinctive jab, so he'd drive it down and, and it'd, it'd snap your head back. So I couldn't read his jab. And that, that's, I was thinking that at the time. He popped my eardrum like with the left hook. And he popped my other one with the right hook in like round six, I think. And then dropped me in round eight. Beautiful, beautiful. He touched up top and then boom, right in the midsection. All your toughness goes, man. All your mental toughness that goes, you can't do anything. And he hear me saying, like, let me go out. Let me go out on my shield, you know? Let me get knocked out. Don't stop the fight, you know? Oh, it's another one right on this side. And it's hurt. It's all in. It's all over. The towel's come in. The fight's over. We had a bit of a chat after the fight in the dressing room. He's a good guy. He's, um... He's a family man, he's a hard worker, and he deserves everything he gets, man. Carl, he certainly did go out on his shield. He took an awful lot of punishment, not just from those highlights that John Rawling commentated there, but he took a steady beating. He was incredibly tough. Yeah, and I, I knew he was going to be incredibly tough, um, and, he, and he, proved, he proved that to be the case. He was extremely tough the whole way through the fight. He, um, he stayed in there for, for quite a long time, really. Um, and, and, you know, without doing a, being disrespectful to him, I was winning most of the rounds comfortably. Um, but he was a, he was a nice guy, and, and, a, and he was a nice guy. It's something that it happens to me all the time. I, I, fight, I fight nice guys a lot of the time, and, and Luke Jackson was certainly one of them. This has been what went down, the Carl Frampton story. World champion at super bantamweight, world champion at featherweight, He's a fighting icon. He's a fighting Irish hero. That's Carl Frampton. I've been Steve Bunce. This has been What Went Down. Thanks for watching.